Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I promise not to tell any poor jokes. I learned my first time through. Uh, it, uh, you got to have good ones, and I haven't figured out what those are. All right, am I in the frame there? All right, very good. So, um, how many, uh, raise of hands, how many of you have uh, uh, a loved one or someone close to you who's been affected by a neurodegenerative disorder like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, that sort of thing, okay. So most hands in the room went up. Um, what I have to present to you tonight is um, a therapy that's being studied. There isn't a ton of research for it presently that's on the books, but research is currently being done. And that is uh, HBOT, which I'll refer to as from here on out. And that, those are, um, initials or those uh, letters stand for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, there's many applications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but tonight um, dementia in particular uh, is the one I'm going to focus on. Uh, hopefully this isn't too long-winded if I decide, if I see some of you nodding off then I'll wrap it up and we'll do a Q&A to get, you, get your blood moving and that sort of thing. Um, so first and foremost, um, what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Um, so essentially what you have is you have a unit that compresses uh, the, the pressure inside a chamber. So you're isolated from uh, the rest of the room space and you're put into a chamber. Um, the depth is what we call a dive. So you're at a depth of about, it's about between six and eight meters Below, below sea level. So it's not too, the pressure isn't too immense. And then we have you wearing in our particular uh, hyperbaric chamber an oxygen mask that's giving about 93% oxygen. Um, this has been a uh, invention, I guess I should say, since the 20s where uh, decompression sickness, everybody's kind of heard of the bends. So our unit doesn't do that, so if you have decompression sickness, don't come see us. Go see somebody who can handle that. <clears throat> but in particular, um, what the federal government recognizes this application of hyperbaric oxygen therapy for is pain, um, burns, and decompression therapy uh, from near drowning victims. There is a, I'm going to show you a video here in just a second. Um, there's a lot of um, numbers that are floated depending on what pressure works for what particular condition. Recently, uh, in August, I had gone to the International Hyperbaric Medicine Conference and had learned that the pressures, there's kind of a sweet spot in particular um, for hyperbaric oxygen therapy and it's in between 1.3 and 1.5 atmospheres. And our particular chamber at Surrey Natural Health hits that sweet spot. Um, there, was, there was a few research studies that were outside that particular spot for pressure, but from the research that I've uh, read, it's in extraneous circumstances, um, such as um, uh, drowning death of a one-year-old for uh, uh, being underwater for 10 minutes and then them being revived were, was treated at a higher pressure. But most of the conditions that I'm going to discuss tonight are in between that 1.3 and that 1.5 sweet spot. Uh, let's see here. What's a PowerPoint without a hang up? You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Here we go. All right. So the hyperbaric chamber looks a lot like matter of fact, hey, hey, you guys can come and grab one of these. Basically, um, in the bottom left-hand corner here, you've got a little, well, it's like a pot, and it's deflated. Um, it's a soft chamber. You might see some of those. I believe Swedish still has one, and it's a hard chamber. But it's deflated, and then what we do is we hook up a couple hoses, and it's zippered shut on the bottom. The person just sits in there. You can do, uh, you can 
can make a phone call, you can text, you can move a tablet, you can read, you can crochet, you can do whatever you like. Um, and <laughs> that's a great point. We shouldn't be smoking anyways, but yeah, especially in the H bond chamber. Very good. All right. Um, but this is one where, again, the oxygen is pumped in via a mask. So you're wearing a mask, and as a result of that, um, that's why we can get away with the electronics inside there. Nothing's going to ignite the concentration of oxygen in there and have an explosion. Some of the harder chambers and some of the more expensive chambers do. Um, but the soft chambers, if they're at the right pressure, are as equally, equally beneficial for these conditions as um, the hard chambers, the soft chambers are, are as equally beneficial to them. So, in this particular slide, this is uh, a laundry list of what hyperbaric can help. Um, these two in particular, um, dementia is a, is a precursor certainly to Alzheimer's disease. Um, stroke recovery, um, we actually had a patient in there within the past few weeks. Um, he and um, his granddaughter who was autistic, um, Dr. G had seen them. Um, just knowing from, I, it's hard for me to be able to assess if it's the hyperbaric that's in making the patient improve because seeing somebody for the first time, they aren't going to be exactly open to, you know, to I, I'm a new person. And so having them in there, um, I don't know if I'm seeing, and I do believe that I am seeing the improvement as a result of the therapy being administered, but also there's that familiarity component with the patient. You see them again and again and again, and you start to form that relationship, so there's that. Um, concussions and traumatic brain injury, huge, huge, huge amounts of research, and that might be the foot in the door that allows hyperbaric oxygen therapy to be further investigated and validated by science um, for the rest of these. Um, PTSD is another one. Um, so I'm not saying that there aren't studies for these, I'm just saying that there is not a lot of literature to be able to say conclusively like we do for traumatic brain injury and concussions, motor vehicle accidents, that this is good for this. There is overlapping though pathologies or problems that occur with, let's say, um, autism and um, uh, let's say memory loss or Parkinson's. So what I'm trying to communicate to you here this evening is, although right off the bat there is not super concrete and tons of research for dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, this, that, and the other, a lot of the pathology is the same between all of these conditions. So it's just a natural extension to say, if this pathology is present in this condition and HBOT helps, in this next condition where the pathology is the same, why is HBOT not going to help? All right, so what I usually do is I usually have a bottle of an unnamed cola uh, in front of me, and um, this is, is kind of to explain what HBOT does. And so if I had a bottle, a sealed bottle of, of soda or cola or pop uh, in front of me, you don't see the carbon dioxide in the solution. You just see liquid and then you see air above it. And what Henry's law is stating is that, um, of course, the gas that's, um, the gas law that states the amount of dissolved gas is proportional to its partial pressure in the gas phase. So when that carbon dioxide is under pressure, it's in solution inside the, the liquid. However, when we twist off the cap of that liquid, we see the bubbles run up and the partial pressures are starting to equalize between that which is in the liquid and that which is above the liquid. Why is this important? This is important because when it comes to pressure on 93% oxygen, you're in the chamber and that pressure is being applied, oxygen goes from a vapor state or a gas into a liquid state. So you're turning um, a gas, an oxygen gas, into liquid and it's going through the blood and dissolving into the blood and being circulated around the body. That's, that's kind of the magic of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. As a result of that, 
and we're going to go through some hopefully not too scientific slides because I get bored too, but um, that you'll see that the application of this uh, solubility of oxygen inside blood, that means oxygen turning into a liquid and going through the blood, is what's providing the therapeutic effect in that laundry list of conditions. So again, um, so here's the atmosphere, so that's what we're measuring it in. Um, the sweet spot, according to the literature, is between this one and two uh, uh, atmospheres. So between zero and 10 meters, it's probably like mm, four or five, maybe six, in that 1.3 to 1.5. Um, so it's not, and I, I did it for altitude because we call this depth because we call it a dive. So at altitude, it's approximately 55,000 feet is about. And if, if you've ever been in one, it's really no different than taking a flight. You know, you sometimes get the pressure on the ears and have to equilibrate that pressure uh, with our surrounding environment. And it's as simple as that. So, um, hyperbaric medicine and dementia. So, you know, when people say that they've been diagnosed or they have dementia, it's not really a diagnosis in particular. It's actually a symptom that can progress or is a sign or symptom of a, uh, a larger condition, potentially, if it's allowed to go. So, essentially, this is say, uh, saying the same thing here. Memories affected, thinking and social abilities, until the person isn't allowed to function normally, what their normal daily routine would be. Um, memory loss doesn't mean necessarily mean you have dementia. Um, I always call uh, my sons the, the opposite name of the other son. One's Connor and I call him Hunter, the other one like that. So it made me feel good when I read that, that I don't have dementia. Um, now, Alzheimer's disease most common cause of progressive dementia, okay? So that symptom, um, left untreated or left to kind of go down that road in particular, is, going, is probably going to lead to Alzheimer's disease. These are just, um, I thought to put these on here too because um, uh, my grandmother in particular um, went through a lot of these cognitive changes and, and um, uh, psychosocial changes too. So I thought you guys could benefit from looking at some of these changes that you can associate with dementia and understand that, of course, it's not a, a diagnosis but more merely a symptom. Um, and this can be due to a lot of reasons as far as what's the pathology, what's happening in the body as to why the person um, has difficulty finding words or communicating or uh, problem solving or completing complex tasks. Um, we'll get into that a little bit. Some of the psychological changes associated with dementia, again, um, you guys may be familiar with this and the, and the people that you uh, know and care for, but personality changes, depression, anxiety, sometimes inappropriate behaviors, uh, paranoia, agitation, and uh, even hallucinations can be a psychological component of that. So what's actually causing those behavioral changes to take place? Well, we know that it's not isolated to one particular part of the brain. Multiple parts of the brain are involved because of the laundry list of um, symptoms that are occurring with, with dementia. Um, nerve cells in the brain, um, again, several areas of the brain. Everybody's different. If you have dementia, it, you aren't this particular group of symptoms. It's just a, a compilation of those symptoms put together. And docs that you would go see for um, dementia, they've got, part, they're using particular scales. Um, mini mental status exam is one of them, and there's a lot of uh, question and answer surveys to assess whether or not someone has dementia or someone is demented. Um, they're often grouped by what they have in common. Um, those, some dementias, such as those caused by uh, medications or vitamin deficiencies, can improve with treatment. Um, very true. Uh, 
we all know that medications have a lot of side effects, for better or for worse. It's just kind of the nature of the game. Um, a lot of people, too, um, I've been explaining to that vitamin deficiencies, if you have too much of a vitamin, it can actually show you the same symptoms as a deficiency. So we think vitamins are great, right? But there's that target window that you want to be in that says that's going to be the optimum for your body to function. Um, this cell, or this, this slide in particular, um, I tried to break it down to brass tacks here, and this is um, Yahoo with their image. So the neurons are basically the giant cells, and those are the cells that do the thinking. And then the glia are cells that generally support and nourish the neurons. And so in particular, you have, you have a neuron here, and uh, the green is the glia, and huge, huge networks of that are what comprise the brain. I'm going to switch, uh, switch gears a little bit with this for um, uh, kind of showing you some of the science behind it. Uh, Nan, I promise to go easy. Um, <laughs> um, so this what I this what I found last night because I was like, there's got to be something out there that somebody's doing currently, and they are doing currently. I I don't have results for you for this particular study because they haven't been um, surrendered to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I'm not sure if all the data is in or, or, or what, but 64 patients um, were included in this study. They used HBOT and uh, Dinepazil, and that's basically an, it's a neurodegenerative pre prevention drug. And then the, that was the experiment compared with the, uh, the Dinepazil, the drug alone. Um, after 12 weeks, again, there's, there's that mini mental status examination that I was talking about. Um, patients receiving HBOP plus the drug had significantly better cognitive function than the drug only group. Um, as far as um, where the number crunch is, is coming in, that still has yet to be reported for this study. Um, but this study, the, or the last study, the last slide is part of this. Um, what it was, it was an observational retrospective cohort study. Um, and it said 64. How many of those actually came and completed and took part in that study? 30. That just happens. Um, and what they're doing is they're measuring uh, perfusion of blood. So they're, they're measuring the amount of blood that's actually getting into the brain as a result of somebody being um, uh, uh, seen as demented or having demented, dementia symptoms. And then, so, I just added that when I, last night. I looked all over the place. There's no data as of that. However, we know so far that HBOT, the hyperbaric, plus the denepazil, is significantly um, uh, increased in their brain perfusion via MRI, that assessment tool as well as the mini mental status exam compared with those that were just the drug alone. Um, this I also found uh, a week ago, um, in particular, and this was posted on their website, the San Diego Center for Hyperbaric, 50 year old fem female, uh, memory decline for about a few years, trouble remembering names and places, misplacing things, typical household items, and then she lives a healthy lifestyle, which, you know, I may or may not take issue with that. What is that exactly? It's kind of it's kind of ambiguous. But um, there's no history of using drugs, uh, alcohol, or ever smoking, which is great. Um, so she was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, uh, with memory loss, uh, and primary Alzheimer's disease. So essentially, what's happening is is she probably had fallen into that criteria of having dementia, and it has progressed to this point. Um, she also has a front, frontal temporal lobe dementia. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a picture of two scans, and this are, well, the first scan is baseline, so before any hyperbaric oxygen therapy was administered to this particular woman, and the second scan was going to be after 40 treatments, and that's typical. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go on aside for a second. When it comes to the medical literature for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, 
the most consistent results happen as a result of near consecutive treatment. So five days a week uh, with weekends off for two months straight. 40 is kind of a, four is kind of a, 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 a good number to, dependent on what the condition is you're being treated for. And it doesn't have to be 40, but everybody's so different that it's difficult to ascertain what's, you know, what's 19 gonna do for somebody? What's 57 gonna do for somebody? You would have to, it would have to be seen by the individual that's themselves and, and see that room for improvement. So she initially went through 20 and then because she was healing so rapidly from those symptoms that we previously discussed, um, the physicians recommend continue hyperbaric. And in this case, why wouldn't you? So what you're seeing here is, this is baseline over here on the left. The color that you see besides the blue is um, blood perfusion and activity of the brain via MRI. So again, this is at baseline, and then this is at 40, after 40 hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatments. So as you can see, the color which denotes activity of the brain, whether that's um, uh, increased cellular metabolism, blood's flowing through there, increased oxygenation to that, you can see between the two that they're pretty drastically different. Could she benefit more if she continued those therapies? It's possible. But even after 40, this, these are two remarkably different pictures as far as how much, how much she's progressed. So it's not about getting more color in an MRI. It's about where the rubber meets the road, and that's where the, uh, the woman is starting to be able to be able to have her life back and do routine things like that. Um, that was, in particular, that was pretty interesting. I have a question. Please. So, do you do a baseline MRI before starting treatment and then one afterward? That's a fantastic question. If I was able to convince our friends at the insurance companies that I wanted to do a baseline and then uh, assuming that whether the insurance company or whether the uh, patient paid for that therapy, do one post however. But that's what happened to this previous person we're talking about. Absolutely. She had an, an example before and an example after. Correct. But that's not the standard treatment? No, no. Uh, because insurance won't pay for it. Well, you know, it's a multitude of factors too. Again, the federal government only, only approves hyperbaric oxygen therapy for those particular conditions that they deem are well researched enough which are decompression therapy as a result of drowning pain and burns right. I would say to your question that's a magnificent idea and let's do that um, to convince to convince others to pay for that MRI which is a pretty expensive test and the kind of the holy grail of imaging in medicine is a whole different story. Um, it'd be great to get funding to be able to run an experiment like that. Say, hey, let's do a baseline and then let's do 50. We'll, you know, pick a, a number and, and, and do that. Yeah. Well, do doctors typically, when they, before they diagnose the person, are they going just by those tests? They don't order MRIs, right? Typically? Correct. And okay. so, for instance, if somebody shows up at my clinic mm -hmm. and they say, you know, if they have an if they have an MRI and they were specifically looking for those things, that would be that would be a gift to me, such a gift. Okay. But when it comes to me, it's I have to say, I know the pathologies of this condition when it comes to burns, when it comes to uh, near drowning, when it comes to um, pain management, and know that some of those same disease processes or some of those same pathologies are the same in say dementia. So, in my mind, it's not too far of, a, of an extension to say, these pathologies are the same. Why would it not work in this, in this particular venue when it's working in this one? Well, and, and nothing is really guaranteed anyway, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they talked about sometimes the, um, quote, type 3 diabetes. So, if somebody is taking in a ton of sugar and they go through hyperbaric, it may or may not have as much effect as if they weren't strung out on sugar because that affects 
the brain and is, is being more and more proven. There is no, quote, diagnosis for type 3 diabetes, but there is the cause and effect of a lot of sugars and a lot of white carbs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think sometimes the person has to figure that out, too, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't say why bother, but... <laughs> right. No, that, that, that's really good. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to... You know, it's difficult to say because a lot of people want research, you know, and that's when that's not always available, then you have to say, well, um, you know, we can try it. And a lot of people will come in and they'll say, well, what should we look for? What are, you know, Dr. Moreland, what are the milestones that we should see in this particular patient that we're using hyperbaric oxygen therapy to treat? And I will say, this patient, like all my patients, are individuals. I'd love to give you a concrete answer because I want a concrete answer so that I can just say, hey, this, look for this, this, and this. But when it comes to autism or somebody who, or who's schizophrenic or something like that, the best measure are those people that are closest to that person because they'll say, you know what, I noticed that this is present or this is absent. Where was there before? I've noticed um, um, their moods have been generally, instead of flux, have, uh, having tremendous flux to them, they've been kind of along the same wavelength in the sense of whatever it may be. And that's hard for me because I, I like to see the research. I like to have a little bit of concreteness. So I think both great questions, though. Both very good questions. So this is being, I, here's, I'm doing exactly what I said I was going to do. Ischemia, so what's happening? This is happening to people who are severely brain injured. Well, part of, uh, part of the hyperbaric is going to help people who are brain injured, but I say, I look at brain injury and I say, okay, well, what's happening in brain injury? And that is ischemia. What's ischemia? Ischemia is a lack of blood flow to any particular region in the body. So with ischemia, we can know that the, um, the body in in, for instance, in vascular dementia. Vascular dementia, what's happening? Well, it's a decrease in blood to the, that particular part of the brain. Where is it going to be? Who's to say? Because it affects different types of, different parts of the brain, which is why you see that variety in symptoms. But in ischemia is ischemia. Blood, lack of blood flow is lack of blood flow, no matter what condition you have. Um, so what I'm showing you here is they used hyperbaric oxygen therapy on um, cerebral, so head, met, head and brain metabolism and intracranial pressure in severely brain injured patients. Um, they used 19 patients and there was a 18 patients with mass, mass lesions that were e uh, evacuated surgically. So they did, weren't involved in the study. But what you see here is that Again, I told you between 1.3 and 1.5, there's your 1.5 uh, atmospheres. 60 minutes at depth, 60 min that's 60 minutes in the chamber. That includes 15 minutes to compress them to that 1.5 and fif uh, 15 minutes to decompress them uh, away from that 1.5 atmospheres. They all received their first treatments as soon as they were stable. They measured cerebral blood flow. So remember, ischemia was lack of blood flow. Now we're measuring what being in that compressed chamber did to blood flow. We're using nitrous oxide saturation to be able to trace, has there been an increase in cerebral blood flow to the brain? Um, and as a result of that, patients with the reduced cerebral blood flow, hyperbaric oxygen therapy increased um, cranial blood flow between one and six hours post HBOT. So those people experienced via one hour of HBOT an increase in cranial blood flow uh, in between one and six hours post HBOT. In those patients with normal, so people that didn't have an injury or they had an injury where there was an ischemia or lessened blood flow, they still increased their cranial blood flow um, one hour post hyperbaric treatment. And then this one, I'm still trying to figure out there on the bottom. Uh, patients with increased blood flow had decreased uh, cranial blood flow one to six hours 
post-hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And what I think it is, is I think it's almost that it's trying to, there's a buffer in there. So if it's too low, it will go up. But if it's high, in the sense of it being increased cranial blood flow to, to where there would be an abnormal pathology, then it's going to buffer it back down. This slide's blank in particular because remember what I said earlier about how when we pressurize that oxygen, it goes from a gas state to a liquid state. We all know that the blood transports oxygen around the body. Simply put, if you were to create increased blood flow around the body to the brain in particular in the case of dementia, you're going to naturally increase the amount of oxygen being delivered to those tissues because you're breathing in pressurized oxygen, 93%, that's solubilizing in the blood and it's being taken to those regions of the brain where that concentration may never reach. And that's why you see the reversal of a lot of symptoms of dementia. So that's kind of a big one. Ooh, I wonder if we can get this one, probably. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. Of course not, all right, good. Well, this was gonna lend credence to my lecture because it was, it was Dr. Oz, and we know that he's- We can do it. The latest and greatest, yeah, we, well, we, yeah, we certainly could. So, uh, youtube.com. If we can get it to come up here, that'd be great. Well, can you get on the internet? I'm trying to pin the right. Oh, it's okay. It's working. Do you need internet? Yeah, I'll take it. Sure. Can you turn it up? Dietary fat, it's bad for the brain. You don't absorb vitamins A, D, E, and K. 
It's not the fat that's getting people in trouble. It's the amount of fat that they eat that's bad fat. The modified fats, the trans fats, these are good fats. Avocado, wonderful fat, coconut oil, even, dare I say, beef, if it's, as long as it's grass fed, has the right kind of fat, the omega-3s. Now I want to turn my hand to the topic that I have got into because I've had friends with the problem. Uh, that any of you out there who have relatives who have dementia already should pay attention to this. It's a revolutionary treatment, it's still being tried, but it involves using oxygen therapy. So if you don't want to explain what this is, everyone's on the same page. It's called hyperbaric oxygen. And you know, the brain cells demand a lot of energy. And energy comes from the cells being able to use oxygen. It's why we take every breath that we take. But we can power the brain, as we can see in this graphic. We can power the brain by putting people into these types of chambers that enriches the atmosphere in which they're breathing under pressure and delivers a high dosage of oxygen to the brain. We see things that are just, it's a terrible pun, but take your breath away, that are really remarkably easy to do. Typically, um, we do about 20 to 30 treatments. But I've got to ask the price because for a lot of folks, it's a difficult to issue. You know, a lot of times insurance covers for hyperbaric oxygen, depending, of course, on what the illness is that we're treating. But I think people can expect to pay somewhere between two and three hundred dollars for the treatment. So, the next up, the gynecologist that I trust with my own family to be able to review functional medicine approaches and have the hot flashes and the weight gain that comes with perimenopause. Stay tuned. All right, yeah. I'm not even sure where that went. Okay. Where is that doctor from? Florida. Florida. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's. Uh, that's Dr. Oz, and um, he seems to like HBOT, or he seems to be kind of impressed that that is a therapy that can be applied to dementia, Alzheimer's. Please. Are you familiar with Dr. Daniel Amen? Am I? Um, no. Dr. G is shaking her head, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if he has any music. He uses a lot of the same MRI scans to figure out treatments. Yeah, he's Most an advocate of hyperbaric. He likes it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's what I love about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Okay, I went to school to be a naturopathic doctor, and that includes having a holistic point of view on things. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is using two things that are naturally occurring on this earth. One is pressure, and the other is oxygen. And to have those revolutions and, and those uh, conditions that I had showed you by just using those two components, oxygen and pressure, it's remarkable. But one must consider that the amount of research w- between the gut and the brain um, is it's completely exhausting. So when it comes to um, some of these other therapies that would be in conjunction with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I would be doing you a disservice if I would just speak exclusively about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Probiotics for the normal flora in the gut so that they are um, basically procuring your vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and um, macromolecules so that you can absorb them better and assimilate them into your body. Super key. IV and nutritional therapies. Um, What we like to do at Serene Natural Health is um, Given a particular condition, what we'll do is we'll administer an IV that fits that person's condition appropriately. And then what we'll do is we'll put them in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber because if we're delivering high concentrated amounts of oxygen and the cells in the body are metabolizing that much faster because we're delivering that, then if we administer and have vitamins, nutrients, and minerals as well as amino acids inside those Um, IVs, then when that cell starts to increase its metabolism, it has all those nutrients that it can pull in and you can get the the outcome that that you would want for your particular condition. This has everything to do with diet, that's why I bolded it. Um, Organic food, you guys. Very simply put, I know it's expensive, that's all I spend my money on. I'll be honest with you organic food and then you know it's it's not that simple but it's a it's a phenomenal start you know um, and even organic food that you could get from a farmer that you know you know I don't 
say any particular grocery outlet or grow your own food you know um, huge 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 for prevention of any and all disease but in particular for this topic um, neuroge neurodegenerative disorders um, certainly ginkgo and bacopa I just use in particular they're kind of my favorite they're um, there's um, circulatory herbs that help to increase cognition. Um, there's a lot of research behind ginkgo, ginkgo and bacopa. Um, bacopa is an Ayurvedic uh, herb, um, just a different system of medicine that has for thousands of years um, celebrated its um, uh, nootropic or its helping of the uh, neurological system. Um, exercise. I, I couldn't emphasize this enough too. Um, I went to a neurological conference uh, 2015 and it was such and such MD, PhD and then you know the, the laundry list of letters after their name and they had this research and that research and the other research. Great, right? The take home message at the end of this three day conference, what can you do to prevent neurodegenerative disease? Diet, exercise. First chapter. It's yeah. It, it, it's really not any more simple than that, other than how to do that. You know. So um, thanks. I want to give thanks to my family, none of which are here. Um, they're watching live on our video stream. No, it's not happening. Um, my family. Um, my sister's place is actually a nice place. It's this place. I don't have a sister. Only one brother. Cedar Creek Memory Care Community, thank you so much for inviting me and allowing me to uh, uh, bless everybody with this information. And then certainly, last but not least, all of my friends and family, Dr. Gonzalez too at Serene Natural Health. Um, that's what uh, so I got. I got some reference for this for you. And that's it. Thanks, you guys. So,